us turn to energy. We were talking about the words of institution, also called the verba, Latin for the verba domini, the words of the Lord. Page 27. Talk about the Pax Domini, the peace of the Lord as well, right? Briefly. That is, okay, let's let's do a quiz. When the celebrant turns around and says, The peace of the Lord be with you always, what does that, what should that call to mind? Christmas? No. Not Christmas. Easter. Easter. As when Jesus appeared to the holy disciples in the upper room. Remember how, we just said this briefly. Uh, the old liturgies have it that if a bishop, um, a bishop of many churches in the region, were to celebrate with the Mass, he would say simply, peace be with you. But when a priest under a bishop says it, it's like this, the peace of the Lord be with you all. So it's even more clearly Christological when the bishop says, peace be with you all. That is a repetition, direct quote of what Jesus said in the upper room. And so that's kind of cool, I think, this, this image of the pastor at the beginning of the words of institution saying, the Lord be with you in the Holy Spirit. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks. And then he turns around. You don't see the face of the celebrant during the words of institution at all. But when it's over, you don't see them actually during the Sanctus, the Lord's Prayer, or the words of institution. He sort of goes away during the period of the recollection of the passion of our Lord. And then when the words of the Lord are done, he turns around again. So that's a sort of a subtle reminder of the resurrection of Jesus after he went away in death. I think that's kind of nice. Then comes the Agnus Day, which is a repetition of what? In the liturgy. This is a calling something else in the liturgy to mind, which we already have. Well, Christ the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What's that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And when, when did we hear from John the Baptist? Just a little while ago. Remember? Look at the glory in Excelsis. Page 18. O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. So we've been already reminded of this. Now it comes up again. This is in the second half, the higher plateau, you might say, of the divine service. There's a little bit of occasional high similarity between the first plateau of the service and the second. This is word. And there's some really salient sim similarities between these two parts of the service, and this is one of them. Uh, we recall also, we add in something that is in the Western Rite, which is not in the Lutheran Hymnal, that is the uh, Behold the Lamb of God who takes take away the sin of the world. That is, in the Western Rite, it's an old custom. And I say that while I'm holding the host and cup in front of the people. Behold the Lamb of God. Where is the Lamb of God? I'm holding it in my hand. So then we immediately go to, O Christ, thou Lamb of God. Tying those together, which means... When you're singing the Agnus Dei, where 
is your prayer being addressed? To the host and the cup. Here is the Lamb of God. He's not up somewhere else. He's right here. He has come into your presence. This goes back now to the Sanctus. Remember how we anticipated his coming to us? Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. His coming was on Palm Sunday. Now it is in the holy service. His, we are lining the streets, as it were. Here he comes to us. In a more, actually, arguably, a more intimate way, even, than on Palm Sunday. I mean, it would have been nice to be there on Palm Sunday. We missed out. We were born a little too late. And we weren't in the right place, right? But this is better. Because his coming this time is also, in a way, humbly, because he's not, they're not lightning bolt flashing or anything. He's already risen from the dead, but he's coming to us in a way for us to receive him by mouth. So, um, in the unused day, we are asking him for his mercy, just as we did in the glory and excelsis. And we are praying to the host and cup. I was accused once. I'm not the only one who had this accusation, by the way. This is a common, ridiculous accusation of thinking that the sacrament is more important than the word. It's a new false doctrine. Did you know that? False doctrine of being the sacrament is more important than the word. The word of God is the sacrament. Well, the, that's the, right. the, the word that's, of God, is, you can't separate them both of them. Because the word of God is Jesus, and the sacrament is Jesus. That is true. However, I think what the accusation means is that you think, or I think, they're saying, do you think that a service of the sacrament is more important or more special than a service of the word? Therefore, you're denigrating the word. Is the service of the sacrament better than the service of the word? The service of the sacrament is with communion. Is page 15 better than page 5? Yeah. Yes. Well, then you share my heresy. You believe the word is more important than the sacrament. I mean, the sacrament is more, more important than the word. I mean, that's ridiculous to put it that way, because as you said, it's all one. You just you took the words out of my mouth. Which is more important, the Old Testament or the New? If you have to choose between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they're all the words, all the word of God. Which is more important? The New Which part of the New Testament? The gospel. Which part of the gospel? The words in red, right? You got a problem with this? Then talk to the editors of the King James Bible that put his words in red. Why in the world do we stand up? Only for the gospel. Because God is speaking. And it's, 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 it elevates this part of the service. So whoever stands up for the gospel is guilty of the same thing I'm guilty of. Because the question then is, if you think that the service of the word is every bit as important as the service of the sacrament, then you're saying there was no need the not only is there no, not only is no need for the sacrament, there's no need for his death. What? There's no need for his death. And you'll never see not only is there, you're getting closer. Not only is there no need for his death. No need for Christ. There's no need for Christ. We're fine. You know, we got we got Moses. We're fine. You don't need to come. Thank you, but no, thank you. Jewish Yeah. So. It's pretty ridiculous. Anyhow, what, what made you think of that? It, because it says about it. Um, the word that is used. Because, yeah, you're, you're praying to the sacrament. Do. Here's another one. 
Is it okay to say that we worship the sacrament? Is that okay to say? We worship the sacrament. Because it is Christ. Yeah, now, interestingly, what a lot of, a lot of erudite Lutheran scholars will say is that the Lutheran confessions declare we do not worship the bread and wine. And it's true. We don't worship the elements which he uses to bring his body and blood to him. But it goes on, that passage, I think it's in the uh, Formula of Comfort, it says, only an Arian heretic will say that we don't worship Christ in the sacrament. Because, you know, the Arians were the ones, you don't know what the Arians were? Remember what the Arians were? The Arians? Days. What? Not, not those areas. <laughs> those are the... We're not talking about the Aryans. Why? We're talking about the Aryans. Named after Arius. Now, Arius lived in the 4th century. And he had a lot of followers. He said such things openly and vehemently as there was a time before Jesus existed. He is not God. He is the Son of God. He is a creature, not the Creator. He said these things openly. And, in, and since he had so many followers, the church determined they had to get all the bishops of the whole church universal. The Catholic Church, that's what it means. The whole church. All got together in the town of Nicaea, which is not far from Constantinople, which today is in Turkey. That's where we get the Nicene Creed. That's where we get the Nicene Creed. I mean, look at the Nicene Creed. And what's it about? The Nicene Creed is on page what? 18? Yeah, we're saying they will spot that man Uh, what okay. Page 22. Now, the Nicene Creed was tweaked a little bit. I mean, it was, it was put together in 325, and it was tweaked a little bit. Some things were added in 381, the Second Ecumenical Council. But the United Bishops of the Church all condemned Arius, making it abundantly clear for all the world that Arius is a heretic, and you follow him at your own peril. They cast him out. This is how seriously they took their faith. And in fact, interestingly, this is why. We do not say, we believe in God the Father Almighty. Maybe you see that in some of the churches. We believe in God the Father Almighty. We believe in the Holy Ghost. The we, in the original formula of the creed, was the assembled bishop. When they started using it in the churches, <coughs> the people, as individual members of the church, would use I. I believe. Now look at the second article, and you can sort of see the vehemence with which the church cast out the teachings of Arius. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made right directly against the Arians. Being of one substance with the Father. And then the kicker. By whom all things were made. This is Jesus we're talking about. Who for us men and for us salvation came down. I mean that's, that's really kicking him in the teeth. They made it abundantly clear we are not Arians. So, No, he's in hell now. On his day, back to the on his day. That's why it's really helpful to think when you're praying the on his day 
of what you just got through saying, which is amen, to uh, behold the Lamb of God. Holding him, holding him up. There. And what I do, it's a little subtle reminder, I hold the pose for the first part of the Anus Day. O Christ, the Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. And then I turn to show you very clearly the one to whom you're praying. Okay, so then we're ready. And I then also just confirm that this is the body of Christ. It's not a symbol in that. Right. In that well, how do you worship a symbol? You don't. So, but, uh, and I said this is. Yeah, right. not a symbol of Right, and now I can't remember the reason. There are, you repeat this three times. First one ends with have mercy upon us. The second one ends with have mercy upon us. And the third one ends with grant us thy peace. And I don't remember or know why that is. Except to say this, in a funeral mass, all three are have mercy upon us. And also I think it's on Monday Thursday. It's have mercy upon us three times. But I don't know why that is. So now comes time for the distribution of these holy elements to the people of God who come forth and because of the knowledge of what this is do a double genuflection. We not only genuflect, we genuflect on both knees. You want to guess who doesn't genuflect to receive the sacrament? Well, the Catholics kind of do. They do after they leave their pew. It's a little weak, though. Who else doesn't genuflect? Anyone who thinks it's just a symbol? Who's, yeah, the, those who think it's a symbol, what do they do? You know they how stand, they have the distribution? They stand and take the little cups. Well, yes, but they are even worse than that. They pass it through. They pew. pass it in the pew. Oh. I remember growing up with this. You know, you get your little jiggle. <coughs> Take drink, everybody bottoms up. Yeah. Nothing but a symbol there. So why even have it? Yeah, well, because Jesus said to do it. It's an ordinance. For them, the sacrament is an ordinance. You do it because you're supposed to. That's it. I mean, it's true, but it's more than yeah. in, re excuse me, in remembrance of me. Yes. And the Baptist church. In, 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 in remembrance of me. That's the big slogan. And that's what they're You do it to remember me. It's, you do it, yeah, that's because he, we were told, we don't know why this symbol is was given to us, but that's what we do. That was always up there, and I always saw that. Yeah. That's why we did it. Right. Okay. Uh, Jesus says, unless you eat my, my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And that, you know, yeah, that's John said. Yeah. Right. So, it, why would, you know, this is my body, this is my blood. Well, they would say that's not about the sacrament. Well, it is. That's what they would say. Also, now that in the in the distribution, there's something that you should know. Luther says that it is appropriate, it is better to receive the host directly on the tongue rather than in your hand. Now, I know that a lot of churches they teach you to make your hand like hands like this to get out of hand. That also comes from some places in the early church. I think it's Tertullian, second century. You make your hand a throne. But that was not universally the case. And the reason it's important, I think, to receive the sacrament, the host directly on the tongue is twofold. In the first place, you're a sheep. So you're not doing anything. You're just kneeling and opening your mouth. I like that image. Second thing, which actually is more important, I'll let you think. I'll let you say. Why do you think that's important? Receive the sacrament directly on the tongue. No crumbs. You gave it away. <laughs> no crumbs. I mean, if I go to somebody else's church and they're giving it in the hand, I don't care. I can't put it in my hands because they're on the rail. You're going to have to put them in the hand. Oh, I, I, guess I, I don't want 
any, you know, what do I have, what do I do then when I go back to my seat? Do I lift my hands up? I mean, that's well, what I'm I, I think of is that I am not worthy to have Christ's body in my hand. Right, or you, or on your tongue, for that matter. But he said to eat it. Yeah. But I know that you make one like a sign of coffee, what you do. So that it's important to receive an I think the tongue. The only assistance that I that I suggest you give is with the host. I mean with the cup. And I've told the cup is being before the court. If you just gently touch the bottom of the cup when it's being offered to you, then it's easier for me as the person doing the distributing to know if you got something. You know, if you have a cup. I think you might have said it already, but uh, other than worrying about the crumbs, it also is a way of receiving without you doing it. Yes, Taking that's the first the, yeah, thing. Yeah. It's, you remember that you're a sheep. Now, I will also say this. Here I'm going out on a limb. Because the great majority of churches in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, do not follow this rubric. But you know that doesn't matter to me. Because it says in the Augsburg Confession, that the duty of the pastor, among other things, is to distribute the sacrament. It is not the duty of a layman. And distribution is a physical thing. So I have a problem with laymen giving up the sacrament. I mean, it's not going to change your world. I'm not going to run away from the church and have that. But I, I have a problem because that is the duty of the shepherd. The sheep to distribute the sacrament. So I have assistants up there. I have some deacon. If I had an ordained deacon helping, that'd be different. Because an ordained deacon's main purpose is to distribute the cup, to read the gospel, and to distribute the cup. And did you know this? Although we have lay reading of the first two readings in the church, you should never have a layman reading the gospel. That's also contrary to hundreds, even thousands of years of church tradition. Because the deacon, when he was ordained, was traditionally given a gospel book and I think a chalice as marks of his of his office. That elevates the gospel for him. So. What happens when, uh, I mean, I wasn't here, when you and I were gone and they did how did they do church without a pastor? This year? Yeah. They didn't have the sacrament. But you have a gospel still. Well, no, that, that's a good question. If it's not mass, it's just matins or vespers, you don't um, adorn the service as much. So matins is essentially, comes from the monastery, and you can use it in your home. Matins and Vespers are home services, so you're just gathering for that in the church. And so anybody can lead Matins. And the Gospel, you don't stand for the Gospel either, you might have recalled. It's just a reading. Yes. Where does the sermon fit into that? Like if there's a lay person leading the service, they can read maybe the pastor's sermon? Yeah, but even so, it shouldn't be a shouldn't be a Mass sacrament. What about giving your own sermon? Giving your own sermon? We had that happen a few weeks ago, the first time I'd ever seen it. One of our elders. Read the pastor's sermon? No, gave their own sermon. What, are they shout? What? You mean a recording? No, like I could tell he wasn't reading pastor's sermon. It oh! Was his own words. Not good. <laughs> I mean, because the only thing is maybe if you were a seminarian. I believe that seminarians are, are only half laymen because they're training for the ministry. Well, I guess it was kind of like he's, he's somebody considering going into the seminary. Not the same thing. Once you become a seminarian, you're in a special class. We did it one time. Yeah. Well, was it pastor? Well, a seminarian, I think, like when I was a vicar, the, the, new, the, the rule was this. When I was a vicar, I had to show my sermon to the pastor before I preached it. He had to check it. The seminary is a trainee. He's an apprentice. 
So that's kind of a special place, I believe. Well, I, I think earlier when you came here, I think it was a death hell. Somebody died and had to leave, and someone else gave a subscription. And it was a, more than a priest, it was, I think it was a lay person who did this, some distribution. And I was very back. And a lot of people didn't think of it. Here? Yeah, it was here. I think it was, uh, was it your mother died, Carol? Well, that would be, that was back in 1997. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that happened. That only happened once. Well, I mean, there's a lot of bad practices going on in the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod. What we need is like a journal. Teach me. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay. So now um, the distribution happens while the people are kneeling at the rail. And the, also it's an important thing for the celebrant to commune himself. Although this is also not as common in the Missouri Center as, as the, I call it a false sense of piety. That after everybody else is communed, then the elder, the head elder, comes and communes the pastor because it looks humble. The pastor is supposed to commune himself because just like a shepherd feeds himself, and it's, that is also traditional in the church. The pastor is actually performing a twofold function when he communes himself. He is, he is in the place of Christ and in the place of somebody who needs the sacrament. So, and we do it in order of rank, which means liturgical rank. So the celebrant commutes himself first. Then if there's a district president, I think, no, then comes the deacon. There's a deacon. Then the subdeacon. Then a, any dignitaries like a district president. Then the servers. And then the people. Just, it's not in, order, in, not in order of importance, but in order of rank of those who are, who are serving at the altar. All right, now we move on to the Nunc Dimittis. Page 29. I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, if that was me, then I can't kneel. Then you kneel in spirit. I mean, every, everybody knows why you're not kneeling. Because, yeah, I mean, it's like it's like a person who's in a hospital bed. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's not that extreme, but it's it's an acknowledgement of your infirmity. So you do what you can. Or someone someone in the front pew, you know, stands up, and does the best he can. We're not gonna we're not gonna make a law. That's another interesting thing about the sacrament. These are rubrics, they're not laws. And the rubrics always stem from one thing. It's Christ. In your presence, coming to be received by you, it is your Lord and Master, your Creator in the flesh. So, the simple rubric is this, act accordingly. That's, that's why you break down all these other rubrics. They're not, it's not legalism, as some people falsely say. Oh, they're just legalists, they're Pharisees, you know, they're, they're Sadducees, they're lawyers. They're making the sacrament into a law. Not true. It all stems from our confession of faith in what the sacrament is. Matter of fact, I was thinking about this just today. When, when we first came here, one of the complaints that people uh, made against me because they weren't used to it, was that I sang the words of institution. Remember that? I, I don't like it. <laughs> because they're used to speaking. And one of the complaints, one of the uh, reasons for that complaint, people would say, well, Jesus didn't sing them. Why should you? That's a good question. In the first place, we don't know whether he did, but he probably did not. <coughs> However, the church in doing this, as he said, do this, in a sense of responsibility and awe toward him who gave us this feast, reflects his word, 
in whatever way we can. Isn't this a part when the private service make it that this is important what you're saying is really important? Well, that's true too. But what I'm saying is the whole demeanor and behavior of the church is rooted in this fact. I mean, nobody told you it is not a law that you should not wear a swimming suit when you come to church, right? It's not a law. There's, there's not a law that you shouldn't, you know, you're just out in the field and you still got mud on your boots. No law says you can't drop in there with mud on your boots, right? Same thing. It's the same thing. And I could, I could make countless examples of this, right? There is no law that says you shouldn't wear a clothing of a clown, you know, and juggle while you're coming to church. No law says you can't do that. Why would you? Now we got some people doing it. No way, Jose. Anyhow, you get the idea. I was going to say, I used to know cows by hand. You got mud and what, who knows what else anymore, right? I remember you said, Father, Saturday night, you had this Sunday fast, one clothing, Sunday fast, and Sunday behavior, and that, and the ladies wear hat and gloves, and she, you know, that used to be on that, and that. Interestingly, that you bring that up, I mean, a lot of times we complain about the Lutheran churches, like in the middle of the 20th century only had the sacrament like once a month or in some cases once a quarter you know we wish we had it more well in their defense i will say this i mean that's wrong that you have it so infrequent that's true however at least they had this they had great respect for the sacrament right you remember these days right whenever you had a communion service it was a big deal once a month and it was a big deal right I mean, if you could, you know, wear an extra feather in your cap or something, you should wear hats in church if you <laughs> But people instinctively, they, they knew this was a special thing because for whatever reason, the Lutherans, when they came over from Germany, were not communing every week. Now, I think partly that had to do with the loss of the custom in Germany. Another part of it was great respect for the office of the ministry. They knew, if you don't have a pastor, you can't have communion. And so if there's a shortage of pastors, and this pastor's a circuit rider, we've talked about this before, that's why a lot of little towns up in Wisconsin are, are the distance they are from each other. That's how long it takes to get from one town to another on horseback. So the pastor comes, you know, he's in Poissippi one, one Sunday, and then he goes to Berlin next Sunday, and then he goes to Another town, Rupp Griffin, little towns. I don't know if it's so much the case in Illinois. It probably is. You know, you go to a little town called Kiwani, the one side, then you go to Galesburg, right? And you go to. Couldn't be too hard to write that. Yeah. And then you go to Monmouth, I don't know. And you go to Macomb. These, these towns. So you couldn't have the sacrament every Sunday because you didn't have enough pastors. But they did have one thing. They had great respect for the sacrament. They knew what it was. So I'll give them that. Pastor? Yeah. When you mentioned about singing during the sermon, when I did Bible study, I saw you. Mentioned what during the sermon? Singing. Singing. When I did the Bible study and the song, the songs of the church, you'll find your service in there in certain lines, and they were all sung. Which, which Bible study are we talking about? The Psalms? Psalms yeah. of Ascent. The Psalms of Ascent. Yes, the Psalms of Ascent begin with Psalm 120 and go up to 134. And they sang them. They sang them on the way. On the way. So yeah. And in each one of them, Psalms, you will find parts of how the service today. Mm -hmm. Sir, yeah. So they were sung. I mean, take. Take, for example, Moses, when he's the, in, at the burning bush. Take off your shoes, the ground you're standing is holy. This was serious business for the, for the people of God. And now you've got, well, I don't want to go into it, but it's, it's a mess. I guess we'll do
tudo, né? Primeira essência. Mas é semente. Semente, yeah. Well, that, we'll get to that next week. Okay, let us pray. Well, God has caused our Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. That by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen.